Hello once again everyone and welcome back. So today, joining me once again is Jake, my resident Italian, and today he gets to show off a little bit of that today because we're going to be talking about wide measure. Now, what do I mean by wide measure? Wide measure has a bunch of different names depending upon whatever system you're going through. Uh, you can also think of this as just, you know, general, just at the edge of distance sort of, or you can also think of this in regards to your wider target area. Now what I mean by this is Within any fencing system, you're going to have a narrowing of target as you get closer. So right now, obviously, we're out of distance, which means that, from my perspective, Jake's body is divided into four quarters with his belt kind of being the main dividing line. So my lower openings are literally coming through the lower half of his body, my upper through the top half. Now, as we get more into kind of medium-ish range, that sort of elevates a bit, where now it's more like mid-chest is about his dividing line, so the upper openings are now Kind of his head to his shoulder, head to shoulder, and my lower openings are now coming up kind of into his ribs. And then finally, not necessarily in regards to distance, though it can be that, but once the swords are really coming out against each other, that shrinks even more. So now the dividing line is really almost more like the middle of his face. So his lower opening in this case is more like going into his chest, versus his upper opening is more like going up into his eye. Now the reason I'm talking about this, is, and in fact the reason that we're currently holding these swords, is because Wide measure is one of those things that I think is somewhat misunderstood. And the reason I say it's somewhat misunderstood is twofold. Number one, some systems don't talk about it as much, or in others, overemphasize it, which is why we chose these swords. So in Jake's case, he's holding a side sword. He's called my resident Italian because he likes to do all the Italian things, especially bolognese, dirty pasta eaters and all that. That emphasizes wide measure a lot. And the majority of side sword practitioners that you will see are going to be pretty comfortable cutting at this range. The strata, meanwhile, the idea of fighting in and winding close, while it is absolutely still often practiced, is overlooked a lot of the time, partially due to the fact that once you hold a sword that thin and light in all our Hema gear and the blood is up, you kind of forget about those things because you can just cut willy-nilly. Messer, on the other hand, kind of falls in the same vein, but Messer's wide play is very, very limited. Even in its more simplistic sources, most of it is along the idea of someone is starting from wide play and you are getting to close play very quickly. The majority of writing you have on Messer is more focused on strata, to use those Italian terms. Reason being is that what this is really, really good at is the idea of cutting from wide measure in and then working those angles from those places. And so that's what most of the writing is going to be about, and of course the inevitability of grappling. This leads to the majority of people practice strata with the messer, but they never consider what wide play can get them and how that can influence their strata. Not to mention as well, again, when the blood is up, they start trying to wide cut, but because it's not practice, it's not turning into anything good. Now, let's talk about what kind of wide cutting I'm talking about, what sort of free cutting, etc. you should be looking for, and how to make most of it with both weapons and any sort of single-hand weapon you can be holding. So firstly, let's talk about the difference between wide cutting to openings versus wide cutting to silhouette. So silhouette, what I mean here is the idea of I'm not necessarily looking at Jake as a target. I'm looking, well I am, but I'm looking at overall Jake as a target. So like I said, at this distance, when I'm cutting at his head, I'm really just kind of thinking about the silhouette of Jake's head. That's his head, that's his shoulder, that's this side of his head, doesn't really matter. It's just that shape. Now this is very, very good if you're trying to drive someone to a particular side. Like I cut in at Jake and I get him to parry in some way. That's fantastic because it's very easy for me to commit where he wants to go and that can then inform my next action, be it a close range action or a wide range action. However, the issue with that is that it leaves you very, very susceptible to counters. Counter of your choice, Jake. When I'm wide cutting like that, it's very easy for him to choose to go, not even necessarily perfectly down the center line, he just has to go enough down the center line, more than me, and he will generally win that fight. In this case, he was doing the Ponza Reversal. But, what we see next is the idea of wide cutting, but rather than thinking of him just as a silhouette, I'm still going to be thinking of him like I would in the Stretta. I'm not going to just wind and hit him. I'm going to wind and hit him in the right breast. Same thing here now. When I cut for Jake at this wide measure, I'm not thinking about hitting him on the outside of his head or shoulder. I'm thinking about hitting him into the teeth, into the neck, into the chest. So now when I cut at him, this is coming a lot more centralized. Now, 
This could be thought of as, oh, you're just cutting to extension. But the point is, it's not about me then wanting to be here necessarily. I can be here, right now I am here, but I can also just totally let that go. I'm going to cut through that target and be ready to move to the next piece. Not a problem. That drove Jake into the middle. Now, if Jake wants to use that same counter against me, he's going to have to put a lot more into it to get me, as opposed to what he was able to do before. Now we see how he had to move forward, and because I was coming to that center line, this gave me more defense. Now, this time, rather than half cutting, no go ahead and through cut, we're gonna see the same result pretty much. Right? No big deal. He may not go in, he may still block, he's in the center line, but not a big deal, I'm not really in danger. So that's the first adjustment I want to make, is number one, I don't cut it as silhouette. I can, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm still focusing on trying to get to that central point, regardless of what cut I do, especially once you start combining those cuts together. So we'll do the first one, Jekyll Perry, and then I'll move into my second cut. So I cut down into his neck or teeth. He defends against it. Next, I'm not just going to think, oh, cut. I'm going to think, where am I cutting? In this case, his face is open. Make that cut. Make that cut. Flow through those target areas and really try to drive it into the middle, rather than just drive them wide. The majority of times you talk about wide cutting, at least with the messer, is always under that idea of trying to get them onto a side so that you can then wind in and work those angles. But once you start just cutting at people's targets, you're going to get a lot better things because depending upon how he parries, yeah, you will get options, you will get opportunities. From there, of course, I could bind over, or if you should cut back against me, I have other options. Just kind of depends upon what I need to do. And you'll find that once you start being willing to take these, more options are going to become apparent. Because from here, when I'm letting myself cut through, regardless of what I'm doing, I'm letting myself open. I'm letting myself be relaxed. So what if Jake tries to come at me at any point, right? I'm ready to deal with it because I'm up and moving. Rather than saying that like, I've got to enter into the strata or I'm going to die. Ah! Right? Uh-oh, now he got all the wide stuff. Or alternatively, I'm going to drive him wide. I'm going to drive him wide. Crap, why didn't you go wide? Now, the flip side of this, and another byproduct of it, is that your defenses are going to start changing as well. Now, this is something that you see in both systems quite a bit, which is another reason I wanted to pair these weapons. And that's the idea of rather than parrying, percussively beating, either with the spine, also, or alternatively using the true edge slash the flat to deflect things away. So in this case, Jake will start cutting against me. Now, the majority of cuts that we're going to see kind of coming out against things are going to be the idea of you catch it, right? I form a good long and order of things along those lines. I stop him, and then for him to come around and get me, he will have to power, which gives me more time to either take that center line or deal with the incoming strike. That's great, great, and wonderful, but that's me also forcing myself into narrow game. This is especially dangerous because, number one, both of these swords can mutate into a point very quickly, and also, I am now making myself more of a static target. Once I stop moving and start fighting from extension, I get the benefit of being able to shoot my shot, but I lose the ability to get back to this wide play. I am making myself narrow, it's a question of whether or not he chooses then to be narrow, which can be good or bad. Instead, though, if I let myself remain wide when he does whatever cut against me, now I get more options. Right? You see this a lot in Dosak play, regardless of what system someone does, and I'm talking about the Purple Heart Leather Dosaks. Most people realize very quickly those floppy things cannot parry all that well, so you start cutting instead. Regardless of what position I'm in, regardless of what cut he's firing against me, moving in the manner of cut for both of us gives us a better chance because once I do catch him dead, then the things really start happening. But for the most part, if we just allow ourselves to flow around, and for this we'll just trade back and forth. Jake will attack me, I'll carry go back at him, he will come back at me. There we go. So we saw attack, percussive parry, repost, percussive parry, repost, and we both kept ourselves moving. It was only when I stopped moving that he was able to get his shot. Now, you can do this in a variety of ways. Right now, we're both just doing cuts, right? And it's very simple. We both cut from our dominant side downward, so it looks like that. The swords will stop each other slash go through. Non-dominant side, no problem. Dominant side up. 
less common, but still happens up inside down. No problem. These are all the basic ideas of we're making a bind, but rather than staying in a bind, we're just using those cuts to one of us is crushing the other's attack, and we're going from there. Once you can start adding to it, because that's the most obvious form, and with sharps can form a bind even when you don't want it to, is you start using different attributes. So first I will show. I will use my spine with some thumb grip. Jake is coming down. I get that nice pop. Then maybe I could go to center line, or alternatively I could turn into cuts. Now Jake will show one of his falsos. I come down with a cut. There we go. He gets to turn it over into a thrust. These are all the same idea, and you can start mixing them in. So we'll just trade cuts back at each other for a moment. You go ahead and cut first. So we're just kind of going back in, and we get opportunities to cut back and forth against each other as it goes. The trick is just keep it moving, keep your feet moving, and everything's great. Now, the trick there is who chooses to then move into stretch up from there, which can actually make it a little bit more difficult. So what I mean by that is that if Jake and I are just kind of trading back and forth with cuts as we go, right? Boom. Yeah, there you go. Keep it flowing, Jake. One of us eventually is going to choose to work off of that opening next. The cut goes from through to the idea of to, and that then gives opportunity to move inward. What you'll also see, the other way that you can move in close from this, is once you get someone earnestly cutting at you a couple times, eventually you get the choice, right? To move inward with the other side of your hand. Well, other side of your body, rather. And this could be a couple different things, because this is also transfer over to things like longsword, pole arms, any sort of thing along those lines. Rather than standing there, oh, narrow, narrow, it's the idea of, hey, let's just open up with a cut. Let's just respond with a cut. And it's a question of, do I deal with it? Do I stay wide? Do I stay close? And just working from there in. Now, the reason I wanted to go over all of this is because this will help also give you a little bit of, let's say, argumento, right? Courage. And the reason I say that is because, especially when you're newer at fencing, or you're fencing someone who knows a lot of counters, right? Now, Jake is also particularly good at his counters, so this is gonna be fun. It can become very easy to start worrying too much about what the guard does, as opposed to what the person will do. What I mean by that is Jake and I are squared up, ready to cut against each other as normal. I am clearly the aggressor of the two of us because I'm in the more aggressive guard. But if I start worrying about, oh, he set up for a false OB, but he could also step out and do a true edge cover, or he could just stab me, right? There's problems there. I'm thinking too much, he will take the initiative. What this allows me to do is I basically, for sake of fencing practice, and no lie also for sake of fencing effectiveness, I go, he could do those things, but he's got to do them right. Throw in that true cut, see what he responds with, and then deal with it. The courage to just cut first, but not cut dumbly, not think, well, if I'm going to cut, I'm going to make sure he's going to defend, so I'll go wide is now hurting me because that makes it way easy for him. That's basically akin to me going, hi -ya, right? <laughs> he's going to counter me versus if I choose to go, okay, yeah, do it correctly. Let's see what happens. Things are happening automatically now because I'm awake, I'm moving. And, nothing, and not to mention as well, when you actually cut for a target when you see it, there is, and this is going to sound a little bit woo-woo, there is an energy change. Very much so. He senses that I'm actually going for him versus I'm just moving the sword. And that's what's going to lead to a lot better counters. I talk about this all the time, that a lot of the stuff that we do, especially in a system like Messer, suffers from this a lot. Sides are a little bit less so. Most of the cool counters we do work way better if someone is earnestly cutting at us. They don't work if someone is timid. They just flat don't work because that's what not they're meant for. If someone is willing to go ahead and come at me, this all of a sudden makes a lot more sense in regards to my follow-ups. Genuine extension, then a follow-up as need be. What this leads to if you both start earnestly cutting and being willing to take these openings from extension is that when someone makes that choice against earnest coming in, you're going to get a lot better results. Now, of course, we need to talk a little bit about the downside of this, because there is a downside. <coughs> Sorry. If, <coughs> if both people choose to 
cut wide and ignore those options. That meaning, you know, we'll just kind of go back and forth, right? Well, we'll go back. That, that's actually a perfect example, right? When both people just choose, I'm going to cut wide, and they ignore what the other person is doing, because they both saw an opening and took it, that will lead to double. Because no matter how good wide cutting is for getting you moving, as far as defensive options, I have to add some energy back into it. And if you're wrong, you got problems. This is a desperate parry, not a good parry. That's why that middle game exists. For that purpose of, okay, let's let him come at me. Let's let him go first. So that when he does go first, genuinely, I can work off of it. Rather than the idea of, I don't know what he's going to do. I'm going to cut. We'll see what happens. Oh, no. Now I'm the one that got hit. So, to sum up my point of this interesting video, because I'm sure this is going to just get interesting as a tag. Wide cutting. Wide play. What do I want you to focus on? I want you to focus on having the courage to just take an opening. Right? When you are working with whatever sword, when you see an opening, go for it, genuinely. But make sure it's coming down in the center, not just stopping at extremity. Have an idea in mind. What that will then lead into is when you take those openings, people will start covering more genuinely because they have to. What that will lead into then is if someone does their job well, you will continue to do your job well you'll start finding more results from therein. What that'll also lead into is the idea that if he chooses to do a counter, he has something genuine that he has to deal with. And contrary to that, if I know that counters are coming in, I will start building my repertoire. And now we're getting counter to counter, etc. That's how you build up that genuine sense of, oh, now this is making sense, as opposed to just, we're all going to study this, we're all going to end up fighting like this because we both want to get that same thing to happen. Now I'm stuck waiting for him to thrust first so that I can turn over and thrust him in the hip. And it's never going to happen. So, thank you very much, Jake. And thank you all very much for watching. Wide measure. It's a fun thing. Play around with it. And play around with it in a way that you're willing to fail. Accidents happen. There were plenty of times when Jake did what I didn't expect him to do. There were plenty of times when I did what Jake didn't expect me to do. That's the purpose of it. This is something that you should put yourself into an uncomfortable position so that you learn from it. Because otherwise, if you're always fencing with the pure idea of, oh my god, every time we square off, I never, ever, 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 ever want to get hit, you're never going to grow as a fencer. So, be willing to take a chance and see what it gets you. Set aside some of the more close range stuff, set aside some of the narrow stuff, and be willing to play, and then you will find more happiness and more opportunity to pull those off. So, thank you very much for watching. We'll go over some other techniques another time.